So I'd like to thank um, Piri for giving such a comprehensive introduction to um, satellite altimetry. And uh, just to take up one of the points that he mentioned uh, at the end, there's been a huge advance in the last 10 years uh, to try and get a better understanding of the ocean at really fine scale from numerical modelling. And, uh, but you have to always have a, a good balance between uh, observations that are at the right um, um, uh, resolution, but also covering um, um, as much as we can uh, the same scales that we want to be doing with our models. And so in that endeavour, there's been a big um, movement over the last 10 years as well in the satellite altimetry community to try and go back and look at our long track data and to better understand what's the signal but also the noise levels in our long track data because the noise level is really the limitation of what the smaller scales we can use are uh, with um, altimetry today. And then tomorrow I'll talk about uh, a revolution in the technology of trying to get a wide sm swath altimetry. But there is really a big effort, uh, particularly to accompany the need for very small scale structures in the coastal zones. So the coastal community are really pushing to get a better um, valorization of the uh, along track data. But we're going back to all of our missions to try and uh, better understand the finer scales that we have with altimetry today. So the plan of my lecture is to talk about um, uh, what we can observe today in terms of fine scale uh, structures with uh, uh, JSON as an example of a um, uh, conventional satellite in KU band, SARAL, which uh, has been tuned to try and have uh, finer scale uh, measurements uh, all over the globe, uh, particularly approaching the coast. And then techniques that we use to try and look at the signal and noise ratio that we can have and also the observable scales that we can get out of, um, out of the present uh, crop of um, altimeters. We'll also, I'll also talk a bit about the new technology when we're going to SAR treatment along the treatment processing. That's a Francaise. So um, it's uh, going to SAR technology in the along track data. And then I'll come back to some of the points that um, Pierre-Yves had uh, introduced about uh, ways of maintaining the small scale information when we're mapping and uh, the issues for coastal altimetry. So Pierre-Yves had talked about the fact that uh, a lot of our um, satellite constellation in altimetry is referenced to the whole Topex JSON series, which are uh, the reference mission, they're at high altitude, they're designed to have the most precise measurements of the large scale circulation, they're very good as well for the large um, mesoscale circulation, they have a crop of different instruments aboard that allow us to make the most precise um, measurements possible. The newest um, uh, series of JSON 2 and JSON 3 also have better tracking so that we don't lose data too far from the coast, but we can get right into the coast and the inland waters. But essentially, these um, are very high altitude. They have a relatively large footprint, so the data is quite smooth as you go along, but uh, they also integrate noise over a relatively large footprint. SARAL was uh, designed uh, to have a much smaller footprint and also to have a much smaller noise. And so uh, it's at an altitude that's similar to Envisat or ERS. It's got a similar repeat to those uh, previous missions, but it has uh, a number of characteristics that mean that it has a much smaller footprint. Smaller footprint means you can approach close to the coast, you can go over inland waters in a much better way. So it's got a, a higher um, pulse repetition frequency, so you get more, more um, bangs for your buck, if you like. You've got more independent echoes occurring every second. It's got a larger bandwidth, so that uh, you can uh, get higher vertical resolution. Because we're operating in Ka band, it's less affected by the ionospheric delay, and so you only need one, um, one frequency band. And uh, it's tuned as well to have a better estimation of the sea surface roughness. And in, uh, in the algorithms, it leads to a, almost a factor of two reduction in noise. So this is sort of like 
Jason has a low beam, a low beam. It, it's like having a torch with high beam, low beam, or a, a car lights. Jason has a larger footprint. It averages, it's uh, got a very good signal, but uh, it integrates noise over a larger footprint. Altica really focuses in on the ocean with um, signal that is uh, more focused, but also noise that's smaller. So, um, Pierre-Yves had introduced the footprint size, and footprint size is determined by the pulse duration, but it also varies with sea state. If you've got a bigger um, wave conditions, then your footprint size will be uh, increasing. Um, KA band for Saral has um, a smaller footprint size than uh, Jason or Envisat. And then the altitude helps as well. If you're higher up, your pulse will be coming down and giving you a larger footprint. If you're at lower altitude, you'll have a slightly smaller, smaller footprint. And so these are sort of the statistics for Saral, Envisat, uh, Jason. And so um, this means that uh, our signals being analysed over a small or large footprint size if we're going between Saral and Jason. Third type of technology is when we use the new SAR along track technology, so or more precisely delayed Doppler altimetry. So the previous missions have analysed the individual um, um, pulses and uh, just average those individual pulses. SAR uses the fact that the satellite's moving over time and that movement introduces a frequency shift, like a Doppler effect, effect, because of the moving satellite. And so as you move away from NADAR, you get an almost linear increase in frequency and you can use that to then position that uh, you've got information coming from the central band and differentiate it from information coming from these other bands that have a linear increase in frequency. And so this is used to, um, to really zoom down and just look at the power that's coming back from a narrow band and in the direction of travel. So in the along track direction, you can focus down onto scales of about 300 metres. In the cross track uh, direction, you have the same scale as a JSON or Altic or um, Omvisat satellite. Um, Another thing is that uh, they use what they call multi-looking. And so as the uh, round um, footprints coming across, they can do the same processing as it's moving through and you can average the beginning, the middle and the back end of the satellite, um, uh, these uh, satellite uh, Doppler bands and further increase your signal to noise ratio. And so this, um, Pierre-Yves had uh, shown how the pulse coming down illuminates in red the centre and then an outside ring, etc. So this is the pulse limited um, uh, uh, return. And then the SAR processing adds in a separation in these, um, in these uh, vertical bands that are associated with the frequency change due to the Doppler effect. So this means that uh, um, this gives you a much narrower slice of the ocean where you're getting the signal as well as the noise. So this technology has been flown on Creosat 2 and applied in just certain geographical areas. And from the beginning of 2016, Sentinel-3 has had this as a global uh, observation. So it's about the similar altitude as uh, Saral or Envisat. Um, goes to very high latitude and uh, it uses the SAR Doppler processing. So just as a summary, this uh, is just supposed to represent what Jason and Saral will be looking at in terms of signal and noise. Jason will have a very large um, footprint. Saral has a more focused footprint for signal and noise, but uh, they're averaged out with a radius of maybe um, three, three to five kilometres for Saral and five to ten kilometres for Jason. And SAR, we have this sort of very focused um, look at the ocean.
So what difference does that make in terms of the estimation of uh, noise and also the, the different ocean scales that we can observe? And how do these vary geographically and seasonally? Well, Pierre-Yves had um, shown this uh, diagram of a, um, a long track wave number spectra. And so a long track wave number spectra, you take all of the tracks crossing uh, through the ocean and you analyze uh, spectrally how much energy is it at the different wavelength bands. So for altimetry and sea surface height, there's a lot of energy around 1,000 kilometers due to uh, changes of the um, gyres and uh, large-scale seasonal heating, uh, all sorts of contributions of the, uh, at large scale. Then there's a cascade of energy through the mesoscale band with the interaction between the mesoscale and the larger scales. And then what's happening here is a bit uncertain because you can see the noise floor coming in from Altica, Jason, and Sentinel-3, and they all have a completely different um, noise attributes, and it blocks the obs observation of scales that are roughly smaller than 100 kilometers. And for each mission, there is a... Um, uh, Jason has a higher level, Altica has a smaller level, and uh, Sentinel-3 has this uh, uh, decreasing um, uh, observation plus noise uh, between 100 and uh, the very smallest scales. So larger than 100 kilometers, all of them observe essentially the same thing. Smaller, they each have different um, error levels. And so one thing we can do is estimate everywhere in the ocean, these, uh, do a spectral analysis everywhere in the ocean, and see how the noise levels are varying from one geographic area to another or from one season to another. And just to note that um, when we're talking about wavelengths of 100 kilometers, uh, if you're going across an eddy that has a, um, a certain diameter, uh, when you do the Fourier transfer, its wavelength will essentially be twice the diameter. So when we're talking about they can all see things at 100 kilometers wavelengths, they can see eddy diameters of about 50 kilometers. So, um, one technique we use for this is to uh, calculate um, everywhere this, the along track spectra, like here in, um, in black, for each uh, different geographical region of the ocean. And then um, for most of the satellites, it comes to a fixed level at very small wavelengths uh, in the one hertz data between uh, uh, one and 10 kilometers. We can remove that then from this black line and we get what we call an unbiased um, uh, uh, estimate that has had the white noise removed and gives us a better estimate of this, the, the spectral slope. And that spectral slope in sea surface height gives us information about whether um, the dynamical regime that may be uh, affecting different geographical areas, if it's in quasi-geostrophic regime, surface quasi-geostrophic regime, etc. So once that's been removed, we can also then look at uh, the intersection between those lines to give us some idea about what scales we can observe where the signal here in blue is higher than the noise. And you can see that if the noise increases, you won't be able to observe the smaller scales. You'll only observe a much larger scale. As the noise decreases, you can observe more and more of the small-scale signal. So this, uh, Pierre-Yves showed this, but this is just to explain that if we take this sort of analysis from all of our long-track data and look at how the error level varies, then we can see that in Northern Hemisphere winter, we have much higher error level in our observations uh, in the, in the um, northern hemisphere. And in um, southern hemisphere winter, it's the same thing. We have these very high um, error levels, which means that we won't be able to observe the ocean structure as well uh, because uh, the error will be blocking more of the small-scale dynamics. And as Pierre-Yves also mentioned, there is a very strong link between the error that we're measuring and, for example, the surface waves and the surface roughness because it's integrated over a, a particular ground track, or sorry, not ground track, a footprint, 
And so it's a surface roughness or inhomogeneities in the surface roughness that are really bumping up the noise or uh, lowering it down. And so, of course, you get very strong waves in winter, and it gives us a very much stronger noise level. Um, if you look at the difference between Jason and Saral for the same season here in Southern Hemisphere winter, you can see that uh, there is a net um, uh, decrease in the average noise for Saral compared to Jason. We'd seen that in the globally average spectra. But their spatial patterns are similar. So Saral is also being affected by the wave conditions in winter, but at a less high level than uh, Jason with its much bigger footprint. And you can also see that it's not just waves. There's also uh, inputs coming from um, the tropics, which may be rain bands, um, or uh, even inhomogeneities that are coming from having uh, calm water and uh, calm patches and uh, rough patches. So there are quite a few physical reasons why um, the uh, integrated error might change here. In terms of the spectral slopes, we'd seen that no matter what the technology we use is, if it's uh, Ka band, Ku band, or the along track SAR measurements, we were still getting this consistent slope and consistent uh, cascade of energy from the large scale down through the mesoscale band to about 100 kilometers. And if we calculate spectral slopes from about 100 kilometers to um, 270 kilometers, this is the sort of global pattern we, we get. And so with these fixed spectral slopes, we're in something that is similar to surface quasi-geostrophic theory about the cascade of energy. Um, but there are a couple of um, nuances for this. The slopes are very weak in the tropics, which is a subject of a lot of um, uh, uh, work to try and understand uh, the different dynamics here. And uh, the, so the slopes are also somewhat subject to the editing you do and also to the choice of the range where you calculate this slope. Um, and then if you look at the intersection between these uh, error levels and the spectral slope, it gives you the, uh, the geographical and also seasonal variations and what your mesoscale um, capability is of what scales you can actually see in the ocean. And so uh, it varies from one geographical region to another. We've taken out the tropics because uh, you actually get very, sm very small structures there, but it's probably the method that fails in the tropics. And essentially, uh, with Jason, we are um, globally limited to wavelengths less than about 70 kilometers, Saral about 40 to 50 kilometers, but you can see that there's a lot of geographical variation. And uh, some areas, you've got uh, very good signal-to-noise representation. You can probably go a um, to smaller scales, if you're doing a regional analysis, you perhaps don't have to smooth out everything to 70 kilometers. But the other areas, you really need to uh, smooth out the noise at much larger scales. So two points I just want to make about this. The first is that um, this was calculated, as I said, over a fixed spectral um, wavelength range. And you can see, if, if you have a color coding, between the North Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic, Tropical Atlantic, that um, the different uh, spectra have a slope that's at smaller wavelength at high latitudes, about the right slope uh, compared to this range at mid-latitudes. And then when you're in the tropics, there is a good slope, but it's at much longer wavelengths because the Rosby radius is actually changing from one region to another and even from one east-west part of the basin. So we are working on uh, recalculating these spectral slopes to take into account uh, the maximum uh, slope and how that relates to the Rosby radius. Second point for those of you with keen eyes is that there's also these little peaks when you analyze the spectral slope that um, come up over the background energy at uh, low latitudes and that's due to unresolved internal tides. We have analyzed the uh, frequency and the distribution of that, and they all uh, 
tie up with uh, the internal tide signal. So at present, altimetry is corrected for the barotropic tide, but not the internal tides. And it, uh, it is something that in the new altimetric maps and also in the long track data, it, there, it's present. And so uh, uh, we're working on trying to uh, remove or have an estimate of the internal tides and taking that out as a correction. So it's a source of information for people who want to look at internal tides, but it's also a, um, an error source if you want to look at the general circulation behind that. Um, last point is that we can also just estimate the noise level, project that back onto where the um, uh, energy cascade's coming down, and get sort of like a, um, an estimate if it was just background noise at very fine scale, then there's, uh, this is what the spectra should look like. And yet we get these like uh, spectral bumps occurring uh, with the different missions, with Jason, with uh, Saral, uh, and, um, and uh, to a lesser extent with, um, with the SAR mission, which uh, has a, a completely different uh, structure. And so if we take the difference of those two, you can see that there is a big uh, bump of spectral energy between about 80 kilometers and uh, uh, around about uh, 5 to 10 kilometers. And we know that that's uh, mainly dominated by the uh, wave height uh, contributions to the error that I explained pre previously. But Sentinel-3, um, because it's got this narrow slice of signal and a narrow slice of noise, it's less affected by the big wave conditions. It's perhaps affected by swell and swell direction. But it still has this bump. And uh, we've been looking at areas where this uh, extra energy is coming from. And it's uh, probably because it's on a new orbit. It's not using the most precise mean sea surface that occurs in the long track data uh, for long repeat missions like Jason or Envisat or the early phase of Saral. And so this is because we're using a gridded mean sea surface and there's extra noise and uh, geoid slopes that are contributing at scales less than about 100 kilometers. So just from this part, um, we've made a lot of progress in trying to understand that uh, the long track data can be reprocessed, re-looked at, and uh, try and uh, get some finer scale sea surface height uh, structures. Different technology and missions are giving us different um, capabilities to look at these small scales. And in particular, uh, SARL and Sentinel-3, you can actually probably go down and look at processes that are approaching 30 to 50 kilometers, but only in one along track direction. Um, and all of the missions are showing some seasonal and geographical variations, but if you're looking in one regional area, you may be able to tune the standard global um, analysis of filtering and et cetera, and uh, really look at for smaller scales in, um, in summer and winter or uh, in particular geographical areas. So one of the impacts for data assimilation is that at present there is a globally average background noise that's provided with the al long track altimeter data when you're doing data assimilation and it's perhaps uh, in the future be able to uh, make available error levels that have um, temporal and spatial evolution. So the second point or, uh, I wanted to talk about was um, uh, the mapping. So uh, this is an example, as Pierre-Yves had shown, the mapping procedure. At uh, day one in the Mediterranean, you have a couple of tracks from the different missions, the different colors respect to four different satellite missions. And then after day 10, you've filled in this sort of coverage. So it's quite unequal in terms of space and time coverage. But should also note that a satellite flies at seven kilometers per second. So it covers roughly 2,500 kilometers in an hour. So it's really a snapshot of all of the physical processes that can be contributing to sea surface height, plus, as I said, all of the errors that can contribute to sea surface height. 
And uh, in the mapping process, you can remove noise, as I said, uh, less than 70 to 80 kilometers before things are mapped. Um, but there's also work in trying to see if we have information along track between, say, 70 kilometers and the longer scales, can we maintain that somehow in our map data, or, uh, um, or do we need to smooth it out so that we have scales that represent the difference between the tracks, so like 200 kilometers, um, rather than the along track scales that we know we can observe. So effectively, we're throwing away everything that's between 70 and 200 kilometers in these maps. And so, the standard mapping procedure, I won't go through the details because uh, Pierre Eve has already described all that, but essentially, for any point in time, you apply a Gaussian decorrelation scale in space, but also decorrelation in time. And uh, so that's the fitting of your dynamics that goes into the gridded maps. And this suits actually very well the slow-moving, larger-scale, mesoscale structures that, uh, that are uh, more than 200 kilometers, they generally move relatively slowly, and this 10 to 15-day decorrelation scales work very well. Um, and here, it's just to say when you go from two satellites to four satellites, the mapping scales are actually quite similar between the products that are the reference mission products at two satellites or the all mission products, but you have more data going into this one, and therefore there are certain structures that you see better with the all satellite um, uh, maps. But they're all um, uh, smoothed with the same um, Gaussian scales. And so as Pierre-Yves said as well, this gives us a limit that uh, because of the spatial and temporal smoothing, you get this real drop in energy at about uh, 100, 150 kilometers, and wavelengths of 200 kilometers uh, with the map data. Perhaps our real ocean goes something like this dotted line, and the along track data here in red, we're limited because of the noise level, okay? So we're between a, a rock and a hard place. Either we um, take the uneven sampling, make gridded maps, and lose all this um, small-scale structure, or we're limited in the one dimension by the noise. However, there have been some studies where people have said, if we want to maintain the smaller-scale structures, we can perhaps add that in locally when it's available along the tracks. And so Aviso is giving us the larger scale, 200-kilometer uh, structures, and if there is more information locally available, we can add that in. It's not um, consistent temporally, because it will uh, only be available uh, close to where the observation is, but it does mean there is a bit more information that can go into these um, gridded maps. And so experimental products have been developed looking at this sort of like two-step mapping procedure to try and get much smaller structures in the coastal zone or in areas where uh, you uh, have a lot of small-scale structures. And, uh, for example, in the Mediterranean, it's an area where the Rosby radius is very small. And uh, in addition to this two-step uh, mapping procedure, uh, Roman Escudier, who is here, has also worked on adding a bathymetric constraint so that the scales close to the bathymetry are smaller in the cross-shelf direction and longer in the along-shelf direction. So there are sort of experimental products looking at better ways to have mapping, including the smaller scales. Um, another one that's being looked at is to, instead of use a... Um, a Gaussian covariance in the mapping. You can construct covariances that use a simple um, advective model that's based on the conservation of potential vorticity, for example. And so you have a stream function that's directly related to sea surface height. You put it into a, a simple um, QG model, and uh, so you can advect, uh, or you can, you can construct a, um, an advection that, uh, that um, uh, assures that you have uh, a simple 
movement around the fluid that's conserving, quasi, uh, um, conserving potential vorticity. And so this has been done and is being tested for uh, uh, maps, uh, aviso maps that have, uh, instead of this Gaussian type of um, covariance function, you put in uh, covariance models that have taken into account a propagation by the, the large-scale fluid, and so you get uh, covariance, uh, off-center covariances, which are more dynamical and flow-dependent. And so these are being looked at to try and see whether we can't observe a small-scale structure at one area and then propagate it, it um, uh, in physical space following the flow. And so this is an example of um, maps in the Gulf Stream where you get a very good positioning of uh, large-scale structures and uh, in particular when they're close to the observation points. But small-scale structures that may be observed and then move into observation gaps, because of the Gaussian decorrelation in space and time, they go back to zero once they get away from the observation points. Whereas if you advect with these covariances that are flow-dependent, you can uh, have uh, some small-scale structures that, uh, that remain longer in between the observations. And this is just an independent uh, view with satellite SST to see that this blob is actually uh, uh, present as a uh, cyclone in the SST. So these are sort of demonstration products and ideas that are being explored. Um, in discussing with some of you uh, these last couple of days, I'd just like to say as well that uh, a lot of the um, higher order products that are based on the um, Aviso maps are also available that you can uh, access directly from the Aviso website. So, for example, Dudley Chelton's technique of detecting coherent eddies and then tracking them over time he developed that with uh, past versions of the uh, Aviso maps. Every time they update the Aviso maps with better along track data or uh, a more recent series or better algorithms, Dudley had to go back and recalculate all of his, um, all of his uh, eddy tracking. So now he's passed the code over to Aviso, and every time they update their maps and then they reprocess 20 years of maps, they also put out um, the eddy tracking, and uh, also calculate um, the Lagrangian evolution of the flow using uh, Lipanov exponents. So these are available as uh, tools that you can use if you're combining it with uh, ocean color, for example, here. You can look at the uh, Lipanov exponents or the, uh, the tracking of eddies. So just um, finally, one of the... Uh, major drivers of us looking more closely at the long track data is to uh, better understand how altimetry might be improved when we are in, in the coastal zone. And uh, you may have already, um, well, we've had a lot of uh, discussion about uh, the importance of the coastal area from uh, the previous talks this week in terms of um, uh, circulation, but also in terms of its societal impact. Um, it's the most difficult to observe from altimetry because the uh, coastal dynamics uh, have the smaller scales and they are also more rapid than the offshore dynamics and their amplitudes also increase uh, with lots of nonlinear interactions between the tides and the currents and, uh, and so um, corrections or models that are applied for the global data are not necessarily very well adapted for the coastal zone. So, for a large number of reasons, the fact that we lose um, information as we approach to the coast with our altimeters and the corrections that are not particularly well adapted, we have these gaps in the standard altimetric products when we get around the coastal zone. So, that's due to a number of different things. I discussed a lot the fact that uh, the signal and the noise comes back from a uh, footprint that has a round uh, um, uh, footprint uh, imprint. And uh, when this footprint comes anywhere near the coast, uh, you get a perturbation of the signal. So this is a schematic showing uh, the normal waveform return 
in your open ocean and that it gets perturbed as soon as the, the, the ground track uh, gets close to the coast. So um, depending on the width of your footprint, you lose more data with uh, JSON with a larger footprint. You lose much less with Sarel because it has a smaller footprint, therefore it can get close to the coast. And uh, SAR processing, it depends on the angle, but if you're coming in directly close to the coast, you can get very close with SAR data. If you're coming in with the coast at an angle, you've still got the wide cross-track part that, uh, that hits and perturbs your, your signal. So a lot of people have been looking at this for a long time, and uh, if this is a standard sort of waveform echo, which they call the brown echo, they have analyzed uh, lots of areas and found a uh, hundred different classes of uh, waveform echoes. And if they look then in distance from the coast, you can see that the majority of the waveforms uh, have this standard open ocean echo up to about 10 kilometers. And then you get this variety of perturbations. And so people are working a lot to try and do retracking and modeling of these waveforms to extract the height information, even when you get uh, complicated bumps or peaks, and that you have uh, tracking that uh, allows you to go even closer to the coast. <coughs> Another problem is the corrections. So one of the big uh, reasons we lose data close to the coast is also because of the radiometer footprint. The radiometer is on board to give a better correction of the wet uh, troposphere uh, uh, humidity content. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, because it uses three frequencies, those three frequencies have different footprints. And there's one that's actually got a much larger footprint, uh, one or two, that have much larger footprints than the altimeter radar. And so you lose data even um, further from the coast because of these uh, radiometer, uh, very large footprints. So blue here is the radiometer signal. This is um, ECMWF uh, weather product. And then, so there's a lot of work to try and improve the um, estimate of the radiometer using different techniques uh, when you get into the coastal zone and having a correction that allows you to then further exploit your uh, along track data. A major error source is using um, global tidal models in the coastal zone because of the nonlinear tides that get uh, generated there. And this is a paper by um, a group uh, who did a review of all of the current tide models being used um, and uh, looking at areas where you have the largest errors. And you can see that uh, the JSON series, which was designed to have good estimates of the tides, um, finishes at 66 degrees north and south. So we have more than 20, 25 years of um, Topix JSON data that's given us very, very good observations of the tides in this area. And so in the open ocean, we have very low errors uh, in an ensemble of uh, seven different tide models. But you get a lot bigger errors when you're in the coastal zones between the different tide models, also at high latitudes. So again, this is a key uh, problem for coastal applications. And so one solution is to go to much higher resolution everywhere, but particularly having increased resolution in the coastal zones to look at the um, uh, uh, small-scale tides that get generated here, and also looking at uh, combining different tide signals to get the nonlinear ones in the coastal zone. So if there is a committed work to try and get more points in the coastal zone that are more accurate with better corrections, then there's a lot of different applications that people uh, can do with a long track altimetry. One of the big questions is with how global mean sea level or mean sea level changes offshore impact on the coastal zone. And so seeing whether the, the mean sea level trends offshore also in, uh, continue or if they um, increase or decrease the sea level at the coast is a, is a big uh, question. And of course, there's all sorts of um, uh, applications about uh, 
um, uh, use, getting better coastal currents. <coughs> And for this example, having better mapping in the coastal zone in the Mediterranean and trying to get a distribution of, um, of uh, larval uh, dispersion and jellyfish dispersion uh, around all the coasts, uh, in particular in summer when people are on holidays here, they like to know they're going to be jellyfish free or jellyfish um, uh, infested. So. In conclusion from this section, I'd just like to reinforce that uh, the last 10 years we've made a lot of concentrated effort to uh, improve the quality of the along track data so that we can have smaller scale structures that we can eventually um, uh, detect. The fact that we have new technology missions such as SARL and the, the SAR mode means that we have small, uh, much reduced noise and therefore we can detect smaller and smaller uh, scale features. And uh, this has also been a great effort to try and improve uh, altimetry data in the coastal zone. Um, uh, spectral estimates have been used to try and look at the geographical and uh, seasonal changes in the noise level between these missions, which eventually could mean that regionally you could use uh, a non-standard filtering to get more information in your, um, in your regional area. And uh, there's work going on to try and improve the two-dimensional mapping so that we can maintain more of the smaller scale structures in the gridded products, which are the products that most people use when they're using altimetry. So, despite that, the ground track separation is still the biggest uh, limiting factor of altimetry when we're going to find scales, be it in the uh, coastal zone or offshore. And so, uh, that's part of the reason as well that uh, developing the new SWAT technology, which I'll talk about tomorrow, is, uh, is trying to get more global coverage of um, these small-scale structures. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <coughs> Please, can you go back to the plot on the spectral slope for different geographical regions? That one. That one. No, the the plot itself. The mesoscale capability. Exactly the plot. So that's the intersection between the spectral slope and the error. No, the ones where you're looking at different geographical regions and you plotted the spectral slope. That one. No. Next <laughs> <laughs> one. <laughs> Sorry. From the three technologies. Uh, no. no. Okay. No. The ones you showed the. The different latitude, how the spectral slope yes. varies with different latitudes. Sorry, got it. Concentrate, uh, thank you. Mm. Um, well, I, I see that the, the slope at the higher latitude is very shallow within the range in which you consider. This is the slope at uh, low latitudes in the tropics. Yeah, the one with the black line. And then the black line is the very high latitude. Uh, sorry, this has been cut off. This is like uh, 60 degrees north and south. And so these very high latitudes, there's less energy uh, than the Gulf Stream uh, or the Brazil current uh, area where you've got very, very high energy here. But um, the ma maximum slope is at smaller, um, smaller wavelengths because you're at very high latitude with a small Rosby radius. Okay. So, yeah, I'm sorry that's not very clear, but the black is the very high latitude mm -hmm. The uh, blue are the mid-latitudes where you've got the very strong boundary currents and mm -hmm. circumpolar current. And then this is sort of like the subtropics and the tropics in red. And so it's moving with the Rosby radius, uh, but it's also decreasing in energy from one geographical area to another. <laughs>